A very good evening to everybody watching. Thank you for joining us on the agenda this week. My name is Toiwan Jobella, the host. Tonight we are doing uh, this conversation from uh, our resort town of uh, Swakopmund. I'm joined uh, by Professor Gerard Tutemea. He is a uh, former Deputy Minister of uh, Local and Rural Government uh, during those years. He's now called the Ministry, of course, of uh, Urban and Rural Development. And he was also a director of elections. The first one. <laughs> the first ever. The father of elections. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> He's the founding father of our elections. Uh, we are speaking to you from his home here in Swakopmund, his beautiful home, warm home. Uh, thank you, Professor, for really welcoming us in your home. I think the first thing that I want to know is uh, what you have been up to because you have disappeared from the political and public life uh, from the political radar and public life and then we found you here in your home. What have you been up to since then? No, I'm observing the total situation, take a note of it. And as you know, I'm also the uh, initiator and uh, founding member of the German uh, circuit, uh, the German speaking Namibian organization um, because I support any effort where we can exchange ideas, talk to one another, listen to one another. So we are looking forward to more uh, dialogue with the rest of the population. We shouldn't well, put it that way in a short sentence. Yeah. The German-speaking Namibians should not isolate themselves, yes. but not partake in uh, the whole life of uh, that we live, and that's the social life, economic life, and political life. Absolutely. Uh, so not to escape yeah. responsibility, but rather together with others, find solution to some of issues. But the main thing that I would like to emphasize why is because there's a tendency also sometimes, in, in particular in the German-speaking population, to prescribe, say, these are our norms, these are our values, and these you must follow, mm -hmm. then we will acknowledge wrong. Yeah, yeah. The first thing that the German-speaking Namibians must learn to listen, mm -hmm. to listen to others, to learn from them, and see whether they can find common ground yeah. on some issues, on some values, and some norms. And we find some basic normal of a ground leveling ground, mm. then we can go up and address a number of other issues. Absolutely. Um, for those who do not rem re remember you, especially the younger generations, uh, the, the so-called uh, bond freeze, if you can give us a background on how you became director of uh, elections, uh, was it uh, a position where you apply and get interviewed or you get uh, appointed by someone those days? But I think I must go a little bit back. Why was I part of uh, supporting the liberation struggle? Absolutely, yes. Please, uh, let's start from that. Uh, you know, I did my doctoral dissertation on the development of elites in uh, Obama, at that time, Ovambo land in the early 70s. Yeah. I did my research, so the first, say, five years of the 70s. And uh, it was the first time that an academic, I was then lecturer at the University of Stellenbosch, was allowed to do research up mm -hmm. in the northern part because the liberation war was going on. But then uh, I took this opportunity to get deeper into the thinking of the people and, and different matters, yeah. the role of the church, the church, the role of the youth, of the people, of the students, mm -hmm. of the officials, of traditional leaders, etc. And then the people of uh, one word that I first say it publicly converted me. Yeah, yeah. I had a different political opinion, but since the mid 70s, 60s, 76, when my I came to the end of my research. I was convinced what is happening here is totally against human rights. And I, as from that stage on, supported the liberation struggle. And particularly, I had close cooperation with, the, with Elson, the uh, particular uh, spiritual father 
to me was Pishawala. Yes. At that time, we had a very father-son kind of relationship. I got the confidence of the people um, because I had a questionnaire. And then my book was published in 77 or 78, where it, I told the outside world what the real situation in and that uh, separate homelands or Bantustans mm -hmm. is not the solution to get an independent, uh, free Namibia. Okay, let's quickly uh, jump and get uh, to independence. Yes. Um, I was then uh, uh, the uh, head of the department politi political and administrative studies at UNAM. Yes. And I was also dean of the Faculty of Economic Science at uh, that time. And uh, shortly after independence, I got a phone call from Hartmut Ruppel. Yes. I said they had, a, I understand they had a cabinet meeting and they talked also to him. And they are looking for a person who could be the first, the, serve on the delimitation commission. Yes. This means to divide Namibia into regions, constituencies, and local authority areas. Yes. I took it as a challenge and uh, became part. We were three members, uh, Mr. Chipanga, Martin Chipanga, and then Judge Stradom and myself. Yeah. And we crossed the whole country, so I had the opportunity to get to ever, every corner mm -hmm. of Namibia, and I said, one principle to my colleagues being on the Delimitation Commission is our approach when dividing Namibia into uh, these entities that I mentioned, mm. we should have a bottom-up approach. Yeah. Go to the people and listen to them how they see should there should be uh, the borderlines. Because there was a task given to us by proclamation that we may not consider the tribal borderlines as borderlines for the uh, for the regions yeah, and yeah. for the constituencies. And that was a quite a, a difficult task. Yeah. So and the, the, and the principle there was also, I suppose, then to say you didn't want to form another regime of Bantustans where no. tribes are, are, are confined so, into a, in Unfortunately, own. some colleagues in my in the party that I belong to, this, I joined Swapo officially in 1991, um, they accused me, uh, I can remember one member, I will not mention his name, Was he was a minister, accused me in parliament that I'm what I'm doing there with regionalism is just copying Bantustan. And that night I sat there and, and uh, thought about myself and put down 10 points. Mm -hmm. The next day I stood up in Parliament and said, these are the 10 points why you are wrong, Commerce Minister. Yeah. And nobody then argued uh, any longer in, in Parliament, accusing me again that I'm undermining central authority. Yeah. We never, actually we strengthened local and regional level so that they can be strong at central level. Yeah, yeah. So after the delimitation report, we took yes. us about nine months, it was then published and accepted uh, by, I, all the names for the region except for three were accepted. They had different names in parliament, that's fine. The Rongo region that I proposed is one is my proposal, like Kumas and uh, Downs, and Kumas region, and Hadap region, etc. These names that I had the privilege to give to these regions. Um, and Martin Chipanga gave the names to the northern part, and uh, the, um, the Judge Stratum also had some proposals. Uh, there's a story, but we can leave it. It's not important about how I was accused in Parliament that I wanted to have the Caprivi region, that it should be uh, named uh, after a lake in the um, in in the Caprivi region, and I was attacked by the gentleman who's now in exile in Denmark. Uh, everybody probably knows, and he accused me like hell in in Parliament that I didn't uh, stick to the name Caprivi. Yeah. What I couldn't understand is Caprivi 
was the successor of Bismarck, yes. the, the uh, president, uh, prime minister or whatever of, of Germany. Mm -hmm. So why we should stick to a colonial name? But that gentleman said, no, we stick to that. <laughs> <laughs> Today, yeah. in some busy region, my proposal was similar to that name. Yeah, I think. Anyway, <laughs> now coming back to your, co yeah, yes, to your uh, question. Uh, then, back in, of, at, in, my, in office after I completed the study, and then two, three months later, got a phone call from Hartmut. He said, listen, we approach you uh, on behalf of Cabinet, whether uh, you are, would be, you have now the knowledge of the whole country, you have been to every corner of this, listen to the people, mm -hmm. so you know the country, whether we can have you as the first uh, director of elections yeah, yeah. for the all four election, local, region, council, president, and the National Assembly. So from 1992 till 1998, I call myself the father of elections in Namibia, Absolutely. and I still follow. And then thereafter, I was honored that for 10 years I represented Namibia at the uh, SADC uh, headquarters, uh, being a member of the SADC Electorate Advisory Council, which means that each country nominates one person to serve as that council and give advice on electoral matters in SADC country. Yeah. So, for 10 years, I did that. Okay. So, do you think then, Professor, that um, you, were, you were critical in laying the foundation? Because you took over that job at a very fragile time of our country. We have just emerged out of uh, apartheid in uh, 1989-1990 uh, and uh, I know for example that uh, the electoral performance of Swapo in 1989 uh, contrary to what, to what people may think it was not the best performance I think the party just got over 50 uh, percent of the votes uh, of course there are many various reasons for that the DTA of that time for example was well supported by South Africa but getting into a new republic and really laying a foundation for what became a very trustworthy electoral system for our country going forward, uh, what were some of the things that you did to make sure, to make sure that uh, we now build on that foundation and that our country now has uh, one of the trusted processes of elections? You touch upon a very important issue and I want to relate it to the present day uh, position. Uh, one thing I really try to do that something I introduce immediately is voter education. Yeah. What does it mean to be a citizen of this country and the, the responsibility that I have? And as it goes, uh, politicians make promises that this and this uh, will uh, happen. And I said we must capacitate the voter why I'm voting. So what I want to say, I, the other day I saw a black hat, a young person, probably about now voting age, saying, no job, no vote. I totally oppose mm. that black hat mm. because you must take responsibility as a citizen. It should be rather different. Yes, I will vote. Definitely, and this is one of the main issues that we should follow on with the coming election. Too many people abstained from voting during the last election. Yeah. I come, come to the other aspect that you also have in mind. But this is very important that we start with the process again of voting, how important it is. The other day I met a person and he was criticizing the government like hell. I said, listen, um, you have the opportunity to express your opinion when you vote. Have you voted? No. Said, no, no, I, I haven't voted, I'm not interested. So then you don't have a right to criticize Absolutely. the government. Absolutely. That is my attitude, my philosophy. If you are a co builder in the governance of this country, we must take note of it. And at our our really purpose for the coming election is that people should go and vote. There's one aspect related to it. I noticed that during the last election, 
the absence was very high. And I thought by myself, what could be the uh, reason for that? And one reason I think it is, particularly the, uh, those who voted for Swapo all the time, mm. all of a sudden didn't vote. Of them were not happy with certain things and kept it for themselves instead of talking mm. uh, about these things. But they have feel such loyalty towards Swapo as an organization that originated in the Oshiwangu speaking population. Mm. That is my party and said, no, 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 I'm not prepared to vote for any other party, I abstain. Yeah, that yeah. is my protest. Yeah. So the abstain vote of, of the last election, part of it is, is a protest vote, that they were not happy mm. with the performance of uh, politics. Yeah. What do you think uh, of your legacy as director of elections? Uh, because as much as you have laid that foundation, at every turn, when the opposition lose elections in Namibia, there's always allegations of uh, rigging and vote theft and stuff like that. What would you say uh, was your legacy in that regard? Have you run clean elections or were you compromised by your swap of membership? No, um, I uh, was no, I was not compromised. I think I was a totally neutral uh, person during the election. Nobody could ever ex accuse me you are supporting one. I can remember one day, I can tell you that, I, that gentleman, uh, I, I can even mention it was at that time Minister Poamba. Yes. He rushed into my office at the director of elections and they accused me that I'm favoring uh, the DTA in my approach. The interesting thing what happened the next day, there was a leading article. They didn't know about that accusation of, of uh, Minister Obama, who I respect mm. very much. Um, but then the next day was a leading article of the editor of the Republican accusing me that I'm favoring Swapo. <laughs> so the day before that, and the next day, I've, then I talked to my uh, the people the, the, in the director of election office, the officials, and said, we are on the right avenue. We, we are in the middle of the road. Yes. The only thing it's a very dangerous position to be in the middle of the road. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, very good one, Professor. So then we had court cases. Yes. For instance, I can remember that from the thing it was UDF. You know, they had to nominate candidates for the presidency or for was it really called? I can't remember. It was one of the two. And there's a certain time given, mm. say uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, and they only turned up at four o'clock in the afternoon. Ooh. So I had to say, no, it's not possible. And they went to court yeah, about yeah. it, and the court said, you were right to the man. Okay. 2000, President Nuyama appointed you as uh, Deputy Minister of uh, Regional and Local Government. Um, how did that come about? What do you recall of that? I went back to the university and I acted very much at that stage as an advisor to the much respected uh, um, rector or the principal of the university, uh, Peter Katjavivi, Professor Katjavivi. Uh, very, I, respect, I met him for the first time. There's another story, but I can tell you another day. What happened when I met him for the first time in 1977 in London? Okay. in exile. The story developed from that time on. Okay. But leave it that for the time being. Come back to your uh, question. And um, yeah, I was then coming back and I also acted as an advisor to him. Mm. And one day at home, I lived in Ludwigsdorf, I got a phone call and I couldn't understand who is speaking. He said, who is speaking? Who is speaking? I can't understand you. Yeah. This is Sam Noyoma. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Say, I want to see you immediately. Come to my office. Yeah. So I left my home and went to his office and said, first of all, I have the right to appoint six members of parliament and you will be one that I appoint at the same time. I've read your articles in the paper on decentralization. 
and I, I don't know whether they word, used the word I was impressed, but interested at least in what I had written. And so I want you also at the same time to appoint you as Deputy Minister of Regional Government and Housing uh, at the time. Wow. So these were the words of uh, our former, the founding president. When, when did you first ever meet Sam Nyoma in your life? For the first time I met him during when a delegation of uh, the, uh, we were called the group of 435, uh, with uh, Olin was at that one time the chairperson, and we were invited through a labor union in uh, Sweden to come to Stockholm to meet Swabu delegation, uh, where we for the first time met with each other. Andrew Lubowski was uh, still living. Andrew Lubowski, by the way, was my student. Okay. And um, the night when he was uh, murdered, I got an anonymous phone call, among other things, that listen, we just want to tell you Anton Lubowski number one, Gwen Lester number two, Gara Tötemeyer number three. Well, man. So anyway, uh, there we in Sweden, we met for the first time. Okay. Um, many of them are still alive, but some already have passed away. That's for the personally, but he knew of me that I, uh, I noticed when I met him for the first time. By then, already my book was published. Yeah. Uh, Namibia out a new traditional leader and elites in Wormerland, etc. The, in Sweden, which year was that that you met him? Do you recall? When was it? That was in, um, a year before they returned home. 1988. So 1988, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. The, the, uh, let's talk about the current situation in our country, Professor. Um, Part of it is that the governors were appointed, were elected, if yeah. you like. <clears throat> of, of course, you get elected as a council, as a constituency councillor, and then among your peers, yeah. you then uh, choose or nominate one of you to go to to become part to become a, <clears throat> a governor. And if I do, if I recall correctly, you served as both governor and and, and councillor of your constituency concurrently. And then, 2014, there were constitu constitutional amendments as President Hagegen was coming into the office. And since then, governors are, are appointed by the president. In Kunene, you would recall, uh, Professor, that uh, Dudu Mororoa there in, in Kunene has been the governor on the ticket of uh, UDF. A popular men within that community and then came a time when no matter how popular you were within the electorate there was no longer an avenue for you to become governor through that process the president has to appoint someone effectively a swap member as we have seen so far what, what, what is your should I give that? you a little bit background yes, to, to, to that time um, I noticed during my time as deputy minister uh, that at that time the regional council said the chairperson of the executive committee of a regional council will be called governor yeah, yeah. and served that name also. But then I noticed by my experience as being getting to all the regions, yeah. uh, I noticed there were complaints in the population that the chairperson of the, uh, the executive council governor is overburdened. Yeah. Day and night he has to be at the head office because there are so many tasks. So they complained that they don't have him any longer as a representative of a constituency because a regional councillor elected no constituency. But he couldn't serve any longer properly the uh, the voters in a, in a, in a constituency yeah. because he was so busy or she was so busy at at, uh, at the regional center level. Yeah, yeah. So then I made a proposal at the time to government uh, 
that we should reconsider and said the uh, present governor is overburdened. Governor should be in separate position. Yeah. We still have a regional council, still have a chairperson, who will get another name. But then on top, there should be a, a person who is then solely, it's a full-time job. Yeah. And it is a full-time job. But I, then I said, listen, it's very important, that was my proposal, that uh, this person should be elected by the people in the region. They should nominate uh, that person. Yeah. And and um, yeah, uh, and should then vote for him. It should somebody somebody who knows the region, who grew up in that region at the best, and particularly know also the proper the, the dominant language in that yeah. uh, region. But uh, this proposal of mine uh, was not accepted by a cabinet. Yeah. Now we have a kind of conflict situation because we have delegated power by having regional councils, by having local uh, authorities, but now all of a sudden you have also deconcentration of power. Yes. Because deconcentration of power means that at central level somebody is appointed, not elected. Yeah. Now we have a clash. And I once during a research visit I don't want to mention the name of the particular region. The governor came to see me and said, listen, I've got a problem. Yesterday I had a meeting with the executive committee of the, uh, with the regional councillors. And the, they asked me, who has got now the final power in the region? Is it you, the governor, or is it us and also the chairperson of the regional council? Yeah. Because the act on the governor is a little bit vague. Mm. It's, it's a general act that doesn't say much. And it should also be, I think, reviewed to. But I am still in favor of decentralization, mm. something that I proposed when I was, I mean, exercised, applied, when I was, uh, was tasked by Comrade President to do that. Mm. And all of a sudden, a contradiction Somebody is nominated, not elected any longer by the people. No. Again, I repeat, I'm very much for bottom-up approach instead of top-down. Yeah, yeah. You are 88 years old now. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not going to stay as president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I just wanted to know if you, <laughs> if, um, of course, uh, that is a very advanced age. It's a blessing um, to be that, uh, to reach that age. But um, the the reason why you seem to be very removed from politics is it uh, merely because of age, or have you lost uh, confidence in Swap along the way? No, I'm an academic uh, as such, mm. and what I did since I have published a number of of books and. Uh, Pamphlet, new well, pamphlet, not uh, so much, but uh, books, and I'm back to that. That, but in myself, I still have got a political soul, if yeah. you can put it yes. that way. So I'm still concerned, and it's my topic, subject, as professor of political studies and yeah. administrative uh, studies to be concerned. So there's another book in coming. Okay. that I look at the uh, particular issue in this country that concerns me very much and um, I, will talk in, I will talk about it. We should not be hesitant to be critical to each other. Yeah. By the way, coming back to one of your earlier questions, why people, the opposition, never accept the outcome of election? That's a general pattern we, um, throughout Africa. I don't know any country. And I, while, while I was director of elections and deputy minister, I had the opportunity to visit 22 African countries. And again, by the way, now comparing other African countries and Namibia, we, we may be negative or critical on this or that, but every time I returned back home 
Yeah. I said I'm back in paradise <laughs> compared to other Africans. <laughs> to where you're coming from. <laughs> yeah. So I pay. I play, I remain political in my mind. Okay. No, wonderful. Um, you, you and still many people come and see me and look for advice. Okay. No, very good. No, no, of course. You can't disappear with uh, that basket of wisdom. Um, the, you spoke about the German forum, the German, the German speaking uh, community of Namibia, saying they must come to the party, they must share their ideas, and they must accept ideas from others. Um, the land issue remains critical in our country. That debate has refused to die, obviously, for as long as the land question has not been decisively answered, uh, it will continue to ringer on. What do you think is the solution to this issue? First of all, you must uh, keep in mind, we don't have enough land in this country that everybody can be an owner of a piece of land. We is, even, is that so? Is it, is it uh, not a... With 2.6 million. Yeah. And uh, look now how many hectares are available outside the communal land. This, by the way, while you talk about the land, that is the other issue that we must carefully look at. Uh, uh, traditional leaders, can allocate land to the people. But the Constitution says all land is owned by the state. There we have also a particular problem area that one needs to address when we look at the land issue. And you know how much land you need that you can make a profit, mm. that you can live on. Even now that we buy farms and we should continue to that people, more people can own land. And we should also particularly look how can we get rid of the uh, uh, situations in our cities, mm. of the shanty towns that have uh, developed. And there we, does it help to give them a piece of land? Yes, they want to have ownership of something. Yeah. But then we have got the high unemployment figure, no, no income. You see all the debts at the moment that Many homes are now sold by auction. Mm. It's a very sensitive, a very sensitive issue. But look again at two six million people, two point six million people. How many? How much land do we need to satisfy? Not everybody is interested no. in land, but I know that many people, the uh, Ovaharero, for instance, if you look at the Oshiwambu-speaking population. Um, they are not so much interested in having farms in the south of Namibia because they are double farmers. They have cattle and agriculture. Yeah. And they would like to have farms that are where you can practice both at the same time because there's a tradition yeah. grown up. And I do have uh, understanding for that. Then we have limited land that we could satisfy. Uh, and do all the young people that go around here and are looking for a job, would they be satisfied? We have a problem at the moment. I, the other day, a farmer, a small farm from the traditional communal areas talked to me and said, we have one pro problem up here on Kumul land, that we have a lot of land not being any longer, longer used yeah. for Obahango or for what other reasons, because the young people are not interested to become our follow, uh, become our successes yeah. as as farmers. Mm -hmm. So it has so many issues that we need to consider. But I am in favour that we should try to find a satisfied solution to that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we must also make our own contribution because uh, we also when we allocate land, I noticed that on a particular farm, four families were settled on that farm. Mm -hmm. But um, it was too small for four families. They couldn't make profit yeah. out of it. They said they need machinery, they need training, they need more assistance yeah. to use land and how to use that land. Of course, I admire the people and those who would like to have a piece of land, but that is not the wish of every person in this country, yeah. particularly in the young generation. Yeah. Do, do you have 
farm yourself? You are a, no, no. You are from Khibion. You were born in Khibion. I was born in Khibion, yeah, no. Uh, I'm an honorary member of the uh, Witboy tribe and I'm very proud of that. I got that white hat <laughs> on, uh, at one occasion. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, I still have a strong relationship to uh, the particular the number speaking uh, uh, population because I grew up in the south. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Your father was missionary down in Cape Man, so but then and, and literates. Yeah. Born I as I was born in Gibeon. And I didn't know the day that we, I was invited to the Bitboy Day. All the horses and uh, copying the liberation struggle and said when I had to buy, given my speech and then uh, Henrik Witboy, the captain Henrik Witboy said, come here, now you sit on this chair. Yeah. And then he called his elders and they came with a hat, white, we crown you now and now, as from now, you are an honorary member of our tribe. Okay. And I'm proud of it. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, speaking of uh, the, Nama, the Nama and German relations, uh, the issue of genocide, I'm sure you are following uh, the deliberations that are going on now uh, an amount has been proposed uh, in a joint declaration between the two governments and uh, the communities are not happy uh, president hagegenkop says you know uh, there's no particular price that you can pay for what has happened what should be the solution what is the solution to this issue of course we are not directly involved as german speaking uh, in, in this country but if they we approach us we'll probably we will give definitive or uh, uh, opportunity we find have to find a solution and it was quite a while that uh, the, it took time till the german speaking population namibia accepted the concept uh, genocide yeah. which i used a right from the word uh, Go, but not everybody agrees. So that is the first thing. Agreement, yes, something happened that should never have happened. The, the people were murdered, black and white, both sides. Um, I don't know the exact number. I'm still trying to find out what is the exact uh, number. Um, and uh, uh, so I am in favor that a peaceful solution should be found. Yeah. They are at the moment still negotiating whether the sum can be a little bit more. And I'm in favor the time limit should come down, it, not 15 years, not, uh, say 10 years rather, mm. and they, that we look at it. Uh, the whole very sensitive concept is repatri rep reparation. Reparation, yeah. reparation, yes. But imagine what will happen, how do you determine reparation? How do you precisely uh, say, yes, you are a descendant of the people. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it could have many implications if one should start with paying money. Many, even court cases eventually. Uh, do, you, do I deserve, did I get enough money, etc., etc. Yeah. So it's better because the whole of Namibia was uh, involved in the liberation struggle, not only the Ovajereros, the Namas, and uh, the uh, Sen, and to some extent, yeah. uh, we must look at the total situation. Everybody in Namibia suffered under colonization. Yeah. Give you one example. We talk only about now one particular group being very strong in, in its demands. Yeah. But who built the railways in this uh, country at, at the minimum salary? who uh, actually uh, was involved in the fishing industry that we do uh, have it. The diamond industry, predominantly coming from the north, the Oshibambo and from the Kawango region, west and, and east. It's not a matter only of this and that group. The whole population suffered and all should benefit from what uh, Namibia, what uh, Germany contributes. Uh, Absolutely. The final question to you, Professor, is uh, 2024. The elections are coming up. Uh, you are a reader of politics. You are a political scientist. We saw what happened in 2019 and <clears throat> 2020. The, the ruling party losing its two-thirds majority, losing the capital to the opposition. 
losing this industrial Small towns. Space, yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, the entire Hardap and Karas regions gone mm -hmm. to the opposition. What led to that first? And how does your party bounce back? You see, it's, it's a... It's a straightforward question and um, I have got my ideas um, about it and I still need that uh, to, and that they are proved that I am right on that. But um, se several things have, have happened in our country since independence. I thought we would get rid of tribalism. No, it's not the case. Some of the most of the smaller parties are still based on the support they can get from their reference group, NAMO, or etc. Um, and what has developed, what I, I'm carefully looking at, what has developed in this country as an anti uwambuism it's a new concept, Uwambuism. Yeah. Uh, anti uwambuism that uh, they say Uwambos have benefited too much from the independence. Mm. And um, this is, a, is it's an anti, not only anti-political, but also anti-tribal issue. It's, and this is something that concerns me very much, which is a fact mm. that this attitude is, has developed, is still developing in this country. Um, I still believe that uh, Swapo may not get the 50% party support, but it will still be the strongest party yeah. after the year. But it, the, it's a trend that we see also in the rest of Africa, that former liberation parties um, and some of our liberators uh, should be more concerned and more less egoistic yeah. uh, in their uh, approach. Not looking at me as a person, but the community should come first. Yeah. And, and uh, so, because the elite that has developed, it's doubted about in the population that they benefit themselves. And the gap between rich and poor is widening. Yeah. All that, that should not be the case. But we have to go back to the people, talk to them, even if we cannot fulfill all their wishes, give them the opportunity to talk yeah. and listen. Absolutely. Professor, thank you for welcoming us in your house, yes. in your home. It's a very, pleasure. Very wonderful and uh, so good to catch up with you. Uh, we will continue to reach out to you for wisdom whenever we have a deficiency, but uh, we appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. Us. That's uh, Professor Gerard Totemea. He's uh, uh, an academic. Uh, also a former Deputy Minister of uh, Ro Regional and Local Government, as well as the founding uh, father of Namibian elections. Thank you for watching.